precedent is, is fairly uh, unique, uh, or rather the focus on precedent is fairly unique to common law. Um, and usually when I uh, when I talk about this, um, I talk with people with very mixed backgrounds, a lot of them with continental law background. So um, the sort of the, my emphasis and constant coming back to precedence uh, seems uh, a bit strange. Um, so hopefully I will be able to uh, to to address that a little bit in the presentation. And thanks to having Mike here, we might even have a discussion about, about why is that important. But um, this is a joint work um, with my colleagues at uh, University of Cambridge, um, Tiago Pimentel and my supervisor, Simone Teufel, and our colleagues at ETH Zurich, uh, Nicholas Storen, Ryan Cottrell. So thanks to them, this, this work came to fruition. Um, I'll try to, uh, let's see. Sides. I'll try to um, move through the uh, the legal uh, part of it uh, uh, quickly, since I know many of you know more about law than I do. Uh, but uh, I'll try to uh, dump on you a little bit of the, uh, the, the intuition about uh, about European Court of Human Rights, um, uh, just in case uh, you are a bit rusty on that. Uh, and then uh, I'll talk more about information theory, how we operationalize these this hundred year old legal question um, about the, 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 the use of precedent um, in, uh, in law. Uh, then I'll talk about a little bit about the results we found out and uh, uh, the most exciting part about what is the takeaway from, from this research and coming forward, what can we do with what we have found here. So, um, let's move on. So let's start with, with what, we, what we looked at here. So, um, uh, the the domain uh, that this research has been done is the European Court of Human Rights, um, and the European uh, Court of Human Rights case law specifically has been collected uh, by uh, Kalkidis et al. Um, uh, uh, and they did uh, a wonderful study using it in uh, I believe it's 2019 um, uh, on how to use neural models to predict outcome. Um, so we use Kind of their work as a, as, a, as a starting point for ours. But um, unlike them, we looked at the case, uh, the cases uh, more, perhaps more holistically. Instead of looking only at facts and the outcomes, we consider also uh, these other components of, um, of, a, of a case. And um, it's very broadly, you can divide a case in the European Court of Human Rights into facts, arguments, and uh, the outcome where um, it's quite unique uh, for this type of case law where you actually have facts separated in its own section called facts and arguments in the section called the law. Um, I'll give some examples of each uh, later on and outcome of course the outcome of the case. So um, when I'll be talking about precedent, I'll be talking really about um, cases that are cited in the arguments of the judges as part of the case. So you can see in the diagram here, these citations are pointing into cases which are very much like the case at hand, case C, uh, and those are the precedents. And uh, again, each of those cases can be divided into facts, arguments, and outcome, which will become important in a little bit. Um, this also raises this, uh, or we'll talk about this, uh, touch upon this idea of ratio decidendi. Um, I, um, I'm sure I will offend any any lawyer with with anything I've written in the paper because we do conflict ratio decidendi with its most literal meaning of reasons for decision, uh, which is very conveniently sidestepping one of the greatest discussions as well uh, in, in jurisprudence about what actually uh, is the reasoning. So for us, it's uh, it, it does come back to finding reasons for the outcome and then boils down to uh, the discussion between facts and arguments. Um, and while Perhaps uh, a little naive, uh, this uh, is not uh, my idea, but uh, an idea that uh, has been um, discussed for a while by, by legal philosophers. Um, um, specifically for about 100 years, we have this discussion of, uh, of the viewpoints uh, that were championed by Halsbury and, and Goddard um, about um, how do judges use the precedent to decide the outcome of a new case. So a new case comes in, you get all the facts. Judge looks at the, at, at the facts with interpretation of the lawyers of the parties, and then needs to use the information in the precedent in those cases in order to make uh, outcome of the new case consistent uh, with the law, but also it allows for some flexibility. How does that work? That's the that's the question that we are trying to um, 
to perhaps put our two cents towards answering. Um, and, and these two very broad views that uh, we are discussing are Halsbury, view that it's purely arguments that surely the way that uh, judges operate is that they put forth a legal a very nice clean legal test and that test is then taken and applied on new facts of a new case and that's the precedent that legal test that has been developed uh, and perhaps changed over time but but fundamentally it is contained within arguments um which sounds incredibly intuitive and uh, and like the like the obviously right answer how could it be facts well um goddard uh, in his seminal essay says uh, this is all very nice um but in reality a lot of cases don't have argumentative section they they, they have only outcome um so um that seems to be a bit of a problem for the Halsbury's view uh, and uh, also uh, they still will be binding you can't have a, another case that comes with exactly the same facts you would expect it to get the same outcome by the doctrine of precedent or doctrine of stare decisis um, the, the way these facts and arguments look um, you can have a look here for example so the facts are really um, in, in ECHR quite dry descriptions um, of the situation of the applicants. Um, um, and, uh, it usually starts with a little bit of the background on them like that, then it goes on to describe um, uh, what harm had come their way. And then the argument um, usually starts with, uh, with actual uh, enumeration of the um, alleged articles um, that have been breached. Um, of uh, the European Convention of Human Rights, like Article 2 here, and then it draws that uh, uh, into the, um, the, well, connected with facts of the case, as well as uh, the, the, the precedent or the previous cases that uh, are cited by the judges. So how would we approach this question? Um, from, from our advantage of using computational uh, theory and, and NLP. Well, uh, we decided to operationalize the tests using mutual information. And uh, what we did is, is fairly simple. We uh, take um, cross entropy of uh, the outcome given facts of the case that uh, we are trying to adjudicate on. Um, and then uh, we take away from that the cross entropy of the outcome given uh, either the Halsbury view of precedent, which um, is the arguments uh, of the precedent cases together with their outcomes and the information about facts of the case. And that difference of these two um, entropies um, will give us the mutual information of the outcome given the, in this case, Halsbury view uh, and the facts of the case. So this is how we would do um, Halsbury's view um, and then Conversely, Goddard's view would be focusing on the facts instead of the arguments from the precedent. You can notice that both, in both instantiation, we are uh, providing the facts of the case at hand, gets the, the case that we are trying to predict the outcome for uh, um, as well. So uh, that information is given. Uh, but in neither, we are giving the arguments of the case at hand, crucially. Um, Obviously, if you were to give the arguments of the case at hand, you are basically giving out the spell out answer. It's a question of retrieving that uh, information from the text. So that information shouldn't be present um, in order for this to, uh, to, to make sense as a, as a test. Um, this is another way of, of, of looking at it. Um, we um, take uh, the information as described uh, in those two slides before. What do we do with them? We uh, concatenate them um, and embed them um, and then use that um, to, um, to uh, fine tune a pre-trained um, long former language model, so a transformer based architecture to predict one of the 30 uh, articles of uh, ECTHR that we work with within this corpus. Um, it's slightly less uh, than uh, the original Halkidis uh, uh, work uh, from 2019 is considering because we had to change the, uh, the data set slightly in order to prune out the cases which uh, don't have citations uh, or the citations are missing in the case. So we consider only those that have at least one citation. And we can extract the facts and arguments from the citation. Um, so this is how we... Um, how we how we do um, our test of um, methodologically, and then 
what we found out um, is perhaps underwhelmingly that indeed it is arguments that Halsbury's view is more widely used in the domain of European Court of Human Rights and Democratic Rights by 50%. Now, why is this interesting? <laughs> maybe you would have guessed it to begin with. Maybe it was a tempting uh, uh, option uh, at the when I outlined the test and you thought that it's clear the, uh, the, the, the intuitive one. Well, I think the, the, the interesting uh, takeaway here is that um, our model, the long form model, language model, isn't great at argumentation. It's a, it's a, it's a state of the art um, for large documents uh, in, in, in some respects, but it doesn't understand the text. The type of analogical sort of uh, reasoning it is capable of sounds a lot more like the alignment of similar facts of cases. So one might be tempted to think that technologically, at least, there would be a, a, a greater chance of are set up to work better for the facts because those should look more similar perhaps than the arguments. Um, but surprisingly, uh, that doesn't seem to be a burden. And that is also surprising because when um, uh, legal um, prediction models are built, arguments are usually not considered at all. Uh, they are uh, stripped uh, away because if you are training on arguments to predict outcomes, it makes uh, sort of no practical sense to use such a model for, let's say, um, predicting a chance of, um, of, of effects uh, leading to certain outcomes in this sort of mock-up uh, scenario where uh, you're imagining that this model might eventually provide some legal advice to some person and trying to replace a lawyer effectively. Um, so, so those things are stripped away. And yet we do see that these models uh, are capable of uh, taking advantage of it. And it seems like the, the, the lawyers, at least according to sort of our setup, are capable of taking uh, advantage or are using that in, in, in the practice, at least for, for this domain. So um, that, of course, begs the question of um, why uh, is this not used perhaps to make the, the legal models a bit better as well. And I'll get back to this um, in, in the final part. Uh, but before I do, there is a, there's another uh, interesting point that emerges, which is that despite overall uh, trend being, yes, arguments, Halsbury's view is the more persuasive one, this is not the case for every single article. In fact, there seems to be um, a trend emerging from um, inspecting the different articles themselves and how, uh, which, whether it's Halsbury or Godard's view, whether it's the facts or arguments of the precedent that seem to be utilized, in this case, by our model. Um, of course, bear in mind that the model and human might be some, doing something different. But, um, but for the sake of argument uh, um, or, or, or explanation of the data that, or the trends that we find, there seem to be... Uh, something happening when um, we compare um, articles which are fairly clear, uh, at least according to, uh, uh, to us, of course, very uh, unscientifically, but, uh, uh, but you'll see what I mean, as opposed to articles that are quite hard to pinpoint their, their meaning. What I mean, perhaps an example, we find that um, for Article three, um, uh, prohibition of torture, which is a very simple statement. Um, no one shall be subjected to torture or inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Um, the, the model does actually go and search into arguments of those cases. And that's, that seems to be giving the advantage. That's where the um, um, Halsbury's view uh, succeeds. Um, as opposed to, you can see it here, um, Article 3, the purple, which is um, uh, Halsbury view, uh, is better than, um, than, than Godard's view. But for Article 2, it's the opposite. So um, why, why might that be? Well, if you look at Article 2, um, Article 2 is right to life, a very conceptually hard to define article, a very contentious article as well. Um, does it extend to 
um, something like abortion, for example, uh, that is that covered by Article uh, Two. Um, you know, it, it, there's a there's a less of a consensus, and uh, you can of course see in writing as well how people tackle this, and you can see how uh, uh, the um, the ver variance in between decisions of judges changes between articles. There seems to be some correspondence. We think that perhaps there is uh, 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 the reason behind it uh, in um, and the fact that um, when an article is, re is, is simple enough or, or conceptually certain, then the judges are capable of creating a test for it um, much easier. Uh, and they actually do rely on arguments. They will try to apply reasoning. Whereas when the test is uh, politically contentious and uh, or uh, just hard to uh, figure out what is meant by it, then they will try to do alignment perhaps more on the level of facts in order to avoid the, the, the scrutiny of the of the argumentation. Um, of course, more rigorous uh, examination of this would be necessary um, in order to, to drive this argument home. Uh, but uh, we trace this in the paper, um, article by article, and, uh, uh, and uh, believe that there's at least some evidence for this taking place. So what about the, the arguments themselves? Um, <clears throat> can we utilize them? Can we make better outcome prediction, claim prediction, information retrieval models with uh, the use of arguments? Um, I um, uh, have actually run some experiments on this already. Um, so the, perhaps the most straightforward thing to do would be um, to just um, um, amend the training data by adding arguments um, as opposed to just facts. So both facts and arguments, but separate it, treat it as two separate cases. So we get more in points of information about what um, articles of certain kind look like and see whether that can translate to uh, um, evaluation and test uh, data where only facts are used as an input. Um, this is coming back to the idea that you can't use the arguments, of course, in order to predict the outcomes, because that doesn't make sense in terms of the, the motivation behind these tasks. And we find, if you compare, let's say, F1 here um, in the table, that if you use facts alone, you get some 62 F1 micro average. Uh, if you use both facts and arguments for training, you get this you know, 8% uh, uh, relative uh, bump in performance, just like that. So very, very simple, you just train it, Not, nothing fancy. You don't have to worry about um, you know, forgetting data. I think you just mix uh, them together, train on more data, get quite a nice performance boost. Um, so clearly there's, a, there's, a, there's an advantage of using the whole scope of data. Um, but um, if you look at arguments here, which is training on arguments and validating arguments, which you can consider some sort of ceiling uh, performance if the model truly thought as a human or as a, as a human judge, um, uh, what, what would they get or, or with that information would they be able to retrieve? And you see that the F1 is still way, way beyond either both and fact. So there's a scope for improvement, which is rather large, which is what we are looking at at the moment. Um, uh, I, I'm interested specifically in shifting the representation of the facts and arguments closer uh, to each other. So um, the, this is it's currently an exploratory work, but um, one way one could try to do that is to see whether uh, using a Siamese network architecture where um, encoding the facts and arguments separately and then trying to train the, 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 the shared weights of the Siamese network here, denoted as these two encoders, to represent facts and arguments from the same cases in the same space. Of course, benefiting from where clearly most information is, at least for, for, for the task as we have outlined it on the argument side, whether that could create much better performance than what we see by just simply mixing them together and, and feeding them straightforward. Because that relationship that the fact and arguments come from the same uh, case is not exploited and, uh, and that 
uh, application of the arguments onto facts, if you will, is perhaps uh, closer to some argumentation um, than, um, than just uh, just a naive uh, language model with uh, linear layer at the end uh, approach that we that we um, use our models with. But hopefully this will this will lead somewhere. Um, but uh, so far uh, these are quite hard to to train or get to work. So I have no no um, elegant results to to um, to produce. But just to conclude. Um, we um, have um, brought in this, um, this, this methodological contribution. How would one go about uh, using information theory, specifically mutual information, in order to answer a legal question? Um, I hope that this might serve some inspiration, uh, perhaps uh, towards answering some of your questions, because uh, cases are plentiful. And uh, this could be a way of, of, of perhaps um, answering um, some, something that you're interested in. Um, but also, on the other hand, we, we do have this, uh, this, this, this revelation about how perhaps uh, one should go about uh, creating better uh, overall legal models uh, by utilizing the full amount of case and, and specifically how, how one might go about it, which we hope to, to build upon. So thank you very much for, for your time. I hope that uh, you will have many questions. I'm sure I've omitted a lot of things that, uh, that are obvious to me because I've been staring at this for so long uh, and I just haven't said them. So apologies for that. Uh, the confusion is all my fault. And um, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Joseph. That was a very nice presentation. Really, really cool work. So now we have plenty of time for discussion and questions. Uh, so let's start with uh, uh, our discussion today. Mike, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, thanks very much. Um, it's a really interesting project. Um, so it was, it was fun to read and, and fun to hear your presentation, how you describe it. Um, so I'll just offer uh, a, a few thoughts on, on this paper and, and maybe directions for a few future work. So, you know, it's, it's funny. I think that with empirical legal studies um, and, and text analysis overlap, I find that many papers are either under theorized or over theorized. And um, if I was going to place this paper somewhere on that dimension, it would definitely be on the over theorized side of the of the of the map. So, and there's a there's a couple of I think consequences of um, of kind of how theory laden this paper is um, compared to the empirics. So one is, um, I think the empirics can get a little lost you know, because there's there's so much kind of introductory theory. That's more of a narrative thing. So you know, take that for what it's worth. The other thing, though, is I'm not sure that you're actually testing what you're what you're setting yourself up to test. So, and I, and and um, and I think this is a problem with a lot of work in this area. So, so you have documents. I I, I think of things in very stripped down terms, uh, mm -hmm. you know, very simplified terms. So you have documents, and there's been some work that does things like, okay, someone's going to go through, again. I just think in very concrete, you know, terms. Someone goes through and and and. Uh, a person reads a document and then hand codes an outcome, right? And people do that. And then, you know, folks take an algorithm and they use the information in the document to then predict the outcome. That's not what you're doing. I'm just saying other folks have done this. And then they say they're predicting legal outcomes, which I think is a bizarre interpretation of, of that exercise. What you're doing is you're predicting what a human will hand label a document outcome based on the textual information in the document, right? That's what you're doing. So you kind of uh, you know, it's just in a very stripped down way. Now, that's not a, a worthless exercise. That's actually pretty useful. Um, that might have some value in the world, but it's a completely different thing than saying, oh, I can take a set of facts and turn that into a judicial outcome. It's, it's just like, you. that's not the setup at all. So um, what, you know, what you're studying in those cases is how do judges describe case outcomes or something like that? Now, I think that you're your setup is similar in a sense, is that it's not about precedent, really, or the constraints that precedent imposes on judges. And, and this is, again, where I think maybe some of this theory can lead the, the reader astray. You know, we get into the civil law versus common law distinction and dicta versus, you know, not dicta and all this kind of stuff. And frankly, I mean, I'm a legal, maybe I'm just a very legal realist type is I just kind of find a lot of this stuff to be very highfalutin and not super um, applicable to like real world decision making. So then I think concretely, what have you done in your paper? You have case outcomes again, which someone has hand coded. 
You then have metadata that's going to distinguish portions of opinions from each other, right? So you have the facts versus the argument categories that you've distinguished. Now you have kind of this metadata in there. And I, what I take the exercise is, is that in one predictive um, uh, application, you identify the cited cases. So you, you're going to predict the outcome of case A. You do that by identifying all the cases, you know, I through J that are cited in case A. You then retrieve those documents and you either use the textual information that is labeled as facts or you use the textual information that's labeled as argument together with the textual information that's labeled of in facts in case A. So you take the, either the facts or the argument sections of opinions I through J. You combine those with the, with the fact information, the, the textual information labeled as facts in case A, and you use that to predict the outcome in case A. So one thing I might just check in to make sure that I understand the actual empirical exercise, but I think that's what it is, right? That's what's going yeah, on. Pretty, pretty much, yeah, I think okay. that's, a, that's a good yeah. At least a base of characterization. Okay, so then what do we, so then, so I think this is very interesting and you, and you have a finding, right? Which is that your predictive models perform better with, um, you know, and, and it kind of different with, with facts versus, or with um, arguments versus fact information from the earlier cases, and then it differs by article. So if I was gonna interpret that, or what, I, what do I think that's studying? So I think that's studying not the binding effect of precedent or whether earlier facts are binding or earlier arguments or anything about the structure of bindingness, because that's not empirically tested here. What you're, what you're studying, I think, is kind of the structure of legal argumentation, something about the structure of legal argumentation, something about the structure of the language and particular citation practices, okay? And I, again, I think this is actually descriptively interesting, but it's just something that's different than what you are presenting here. And, I, and this is a very tricky thing about, um, you know, about this whole setup, about, you know, the kind of the data structure that you have is you're still using information in the case at hand to predict the outcome, right? You're using the cases that are cited. Um, in that opinion. And then you're chasing down some additional information, which is cool. That's very interesting. But it's different than like an experimental setup where, you know, if what you were interested in was studying, you know, the binding effect of precedent, then what's your ideal experiment? It's something like, okay, let's imagine two worlds, one where the fact, you know, what maybe exactly one where the arguments in a case are different, you know, some counterfactual where, the, where you perturb the arguments of the earlier decision, a relevant earlier decision. And again, I don't think you could just use the decisions in, um, in the, I got a fly attacking my face. Um, you wouldn't use the decisions that are uh, cited in the case because that's endogenous thing to the thing that you're trying to study, right? I think you'd have to have some, you know, other yeah. uh, metric for relevance and then you'd use that. So, it's very, it's a very kind of complex thing. So, so I think you're making progress in this paper on something. I am pretty sure about that, which is good. And, but I, I, I'm not sure that it's the question that you've set up. Um, okay, I just a couple, so that's like a kind of my big picture thing is just the, the relationship of the theory and whether you need this stuff about, you know, like for one thing, the civil law, common law thing just goes awry because you end up studying like the European Court of Human Rights, which is like, it's contentious about whether it's a civil <laughs> or jurisdiction. It's not a common law jurisdiction. It's just one that relies on some precedent and, you know, but, uh, you know, look, French courts rely on precedent. They're canonically civil, you know, and would they, they certainly wouldn't characterize themselves as a common law jurisdiction, but we say that like French court issues an opinion, it offers no guidance whatsoever about how a very similar case that would come down into a subsequent decision, right? And I, so I would just like drop all that stuff, frankly. And I would also just drop all the, the dicta and all that. This is like way too much stuff in there. And then, and, and reconceive somewhat of the object of study here as about language of kind of justification rather than, um, rather than bindingness. Because bindingness is like just an incredibly hard thing to study. Just a couple of other thoughts on this. I don't know if you have access to briefs before the court but that's kind of an external thing. So that's not the court itself providing the data. You have data from briefs. So I think this is just like a radically better um, 
uh, data set. And it can be hard to get your hands on. So I don't know the whole, the whole story with that. Um, so the article by article analysis. So this is just like the problem with this kind of stuff is when you combine any kind of um, empirical quantitative analysis and then use some qualitative analysis. That can actually be quite illuminating, the qualitative analysis, but it can also is subject to all the problems associated with, you know, qualitative analysis, so sub subjectiveness, post hoc stuff, you know, that kind of thing. So for example, the, the two articles that you cite in the presentation, the one on the right to life versus the right to not be tortured, right? And I think the idea there is that the one, the right to life is supposed to be uh, more open-ended than the right not to be tortured or be subject to inhumane treatment. I mean, if you had just showed me those two things without any background knowledge whatsoever, I hadn't read your paper, I knew nothing about the you said, which one of these is more open textured, right? Which one of these is more amenable to judicial or articulation over time or which one's less clear or more fact dependent or anything like that. I would just have said uh, they're identical. They're, I cannot see any difference between the two of these. You know, what's inhumane treatment? I mean, that could be a gajillion. Does that include positive economic rights? You know, a right to a job, a right to housing? I mean, you know, the other thing could just be like the state can't kill you without due process or something like that. It could be super narrow. And it's just a historical contingency about which one of these gets articulated in a more open textured way. Um, I don't think there's anything that, uh, that you would just look at that language and automatically come to that conclusion. So, um, so I think that's very tricky to kind of go back after you've got your data and then say, like you could try to maybe get some people who haven't looked at your paper, um, like research assistants or something to have them code up the articles according to some criteria and see if they even agree with each other about what those criteria are. And then see if that, you know, links into, um, you know, how those, you know, it could also just be random, like how far away from which is like a random distribution over these articles are we? Um, I think that would be another question. So, so anyway, that's like a bunch of stuff. It's a lot about interpretation. I mean, I think the, that's the, just the final note is what I think is most kind of interesting about the paper and really useful is you've done a cool empirical exercise where you've gone through and you've traced down this information in the cited cases, and you're definitely studying something about citation practices in the European Court of Human Rights and something about the, how those citation practices relate to you know, different parts of, of de different documents. So there's definitely something interesting in here, um, but I think that it gets a little bogged down in the, in the theory sections. And I think it, in a way that might lead a reader astray about what you're ultimately, um, what you're ultimately studying. So those, those are a bunch of, um, of different uh, thoughts, comments um, for what they're worth. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Joseph. Um, yeah, no, I, I I agree with all of it. I I, I don't have a I don't have a, a, a problem uh, with, with the interpretation, I, and I I think it, it should be much clearer in the paper. Um, we we use the the discussion in order to uh, motivate the research uh, primarily. Uh, so I there is a self awareness that we are um, um, uh, we are saying look, this is something that lawyers care about. Um, that's why we are doing this. What's, what, what to anyone else seems like some sort of weird exercise uh, of, of no merit. To what extent we manage to contribute to that discussion? Absolutely. Very hard to, to, to quantify on its own. Um, I think the defense would be, well, we think that the, na the perhaps naive approach of information theory to treat this as a task of how easy it is to extract the, inf the necessary information from the text alone is the angle that one perhaps reasonably should take in order to answer such question. That you don't have to um, get into the, the discussion of um, how um, this should be annotated, broken down of the difference between how people perceive stuff. Uh, it is almost a speed test of extraction. And we want probably answer each question easily as and as well um, and with with variance between people um, uh, with 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 uh, with either facts or arguments. But we kind of twist it and ask, well, which one is just much easier? We have this dumb machine that can just align it. And we can uh, we have the advantage here. The computational advantage here really is um, uh, not on the side of expertise. Uh, and, and utilizing any argumentation, it's on the fact that we can fix um, the, uh, the the viewer across thousands of, uh, in this case, around ten thousand cases. 
in order to measure that ability to extract that information. And that on its own is a, a valid empirical observation. Um, um, of course, how do you link it into the theory? Yeah, um, I, I, I'm very happy that, you, uh, that you've uncovered our, our sleight of hand. I hope that we are not doing it uh, as a sleight of hand. I, I, I uh, <laughs> was very keen to try to write it as a motivation uh, rather than that, rather than uh, a statement of that we are actually answering it and then with the interpretation at the end same uh, same is true that uh, uh, it's it's using the the observation which is yes ease of extraction of information that we we observe and trying to again port it back uh, um, um, perhaps uh, uh, ham-fistedly onto the articles which is yeah uh, it's a it's it's a hard thing to it's a hard thing to do it's very contagious and uh, yeah so I, I wouldn't uh, I would yeah, just to just to kind of, I, I'm very sympathetic for what it's worth. You know that um, it can be, it can be. We have these interesting and powerful tools, and then we often have a legal discourse that's kind of clunky. And the, uh, you know, kind of getting these things to fit together can is it can be a real challenge. It can be the mm -hmm. kind of the most challenging parts of the of these projects. With respect to the bundles, I, oh, how, how I would like to have access to. The bundles to the cases and and set up uh, of course with some real sort of argumentation as the adversary real nature of the two sides actually presenting the different arguments. Um, uh, when you speak about we, we use the information from arguments, the the the, uh, the citations. I quite like that uh, personally because ultimately the test is how would a judge decide given these this set of precedent. And of course, the judge could uh, lean either way uh, in, in, in a lot of in a lot of sense. I don't, I, I'm not so sure that there is a um, empirical legal truth being uncovered and discovered. There's a, there's, there's a lot of interpretation, of course. Um, and um, and we are uh, taking as a subject at every single point the judge at hand. Uh, and I think that is not uh, well. The, 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 it's not a thoughtless decision. It's not. Uh, um, it 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 is. Part of the design in order for this to sort of make sense because that that is the operationalization of their uh, of the of the Hasbro and Goddard's test as well. It is the the decision at hand with the information at hand. Um, so yeah, I I wonder uh, though um, in order to study any of this, of course, in 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 terms of perturbation stuff, when you when you when you mention these things. What what kind of uh, do you imagine uh, some sort of tests for Asher like like Wombo's test where you are changing uh, um, you know the, the 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 minimal change in order to change the outcome right. is that what you're right. getting at so, or is so yeah so so this is just kind of comes from straight up kind of empirical legal research and just empirical social sciences more generally right so are we are you trying to make a causal claim here that's the question right are you saying X causes Y so if the precedent was different or if the arguments were different, if there's something about the prior cases was different, that would lead to a different outcome. So that's the, that's the, so what, that's one, right? Is, are you making a causal claim? <laughs> Do you want to make a causal No, we claim? don't touch that. We don't touch that at all. That's not at all what we put forward. Okay. Okay. So then I think that, that the, this, the reason I thought you might have been making a causal claim is, is based. So, okay. Let me, so let me bifurcate. If you were making a causal claim, that's where I get into the perturbation stuff. If you're not, if you're not making a causal claim, you're making it, uh, predictive or a, um, you know, or just a descriptive claim, then I think this is orthogonal or very, very, very uh, uh, distinct from the conversation in jurisprudence about the nature of precedent. That's what I think the problem is, because the conversation in, in, in jurisprudence is causal because it's about the constraints that precedent places on judges the constraints that prior decisions create for future decisions. And that's a causal claim, because you're gonna say, if the constraints were different, then the outcomes would be different, right? Or if the constraints weren't there or whatever, those are, those are causal. Yeah. And so if you are, so, so you framed the setup as relating to a conversation about causes within legal decision-making, but then what you wanna say is, oh, well, we're not, we're not, doing causes here we're not doing we're not investigating causation and so i think that it, it that's tough i think that's going to be a hard thing to argue right 
we are very careful in selection. Uh, th that's why we choose uh, um, um, the, um, the the two viewpoints that we chosen. They are carefully cherry picked. Um, the beauty of them is that they are not causal. They are not saying uh, they are not saying that. Uh, I mean, they are not saying that they're in the sense of changing one or the other would would change the outcome. They are just asking whether looking at the previous facts or looking at previous arguments is. Has, has has impact more of an impact on the outcome that's that's the it, that's it, impact is cause in, it, impact is a cause though well that's the ease of uh, of of retrieval from it in a way right it's it, it's a very norm, both are very normative in that sense they both view I mean, so I, okay so if you're gonna if, so i think just talking about precedent then there's two ways to talk about precedent there's one is that and i think this is the standard in the in the in the jury in kind of how jurisprudence talk about precedent is about constraints, right? That precedent imposes constraints on, on future decision-making, okay? And it could be the facts, it could be the arguments, whatever it is, something, yeah. you, know, it, you know, if the case, if the prior case had been decided differently, the idea is that that should have an effect, a causal effect on future decisions. That's generally what is meant by the kind of concept of precedent and starting decisions. There would be another way of talking about this, which I'm pretty sure that Hausberg and Goodard would reject. But there could be another way of talking about this, which is that precedent is just a way that judges uh, justify their decisions. So the judge today draw on precedent as a justification. But actually, that ju the prior stock of decisions have no causal influence on today's decisions. It's just a, it's just a, a justificatory language. It's a resource that can be used to justify a decision. Now, that's a, like a legal realist position. And I'm pretty sure that Hausberg and Godard don't take that position. That might be closer to what you're talking about, which would be fine. But then I think, again, the setup and the theory would be different. Well, the, the, but if you look at what they are actually talking about, they are, they are asking the question about the discretion of a judge. They are not talking about uh, the, uh, the, the, the precedent as, uh, or questioning the precedent uh, constraint, the, the, the extent of its constraint. They are really talking about, that's kind of this, the naivety of it, of whether it is based in argument or in in fact, which are the two sides of uh, of, of of the sort of the, the basic distinction of the of the two sides of it, and that's their discretion, right? And there's no 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 no. no. I'm sorry. I I think this is this. We can maybe talk. I don't want to. I you might have other que other people might have questions for you, but like, and again, I think this is there's maybe like a meta point here, and then we could get into the the, the details. So I think the meta point is that the theory is in tank is getting you uh, crosswise with your empirics. What's interesting here is the empirics and it's not some kind of contribution to jurisprudence <laughs> because that's not what you want to do. You don't want to do jurisprudence. You want to do NLP, um, I think. So, so, so that's just, that's just like a meta point for what it's worth. That's just my take. Um, two is again, I'm not that familiar with these legal philosophers. I would be, bowled over if their view wasn't something along the lines of, you know, there was a prior decision, okay? The prior decision could have come out in lots of different ways. Characteristics of these prior decisions, either the, how, either the facts of them or the, the rules that are announced in the earlier decisions, that those have some effect in the world, a causal effect on the world in future decisions. And is it the facts of those characteristics that then determine the scope of the causal influence or is it the reasoning or what is it those are all questions about you know cause it, causation and causality right i'm not sure what else they could possibly be about um well the outcome is fixed that's the that's the key i think the, key. the, outcome, the outcome today or the outcome in the past outcome. we fix the outcome and we ask what would that particular judge the question is did that particular judge do they rely more on facts or did they rely more on arguments? And we don't know rely, that. When you say yeah. rely, what do you mean by rely? Did they reach the decision by aligning facts with facts? Or did they that reach the causal decision by looking at, um, at the argumentation and perhaps extracting some? Um, okay, so, so this is, that's causal. So, right, but the causality is not that question at all. Like the, it's a discretion between decision between these two. They are, we are not considering where you're not even engaging with the question that they would change their mind if they were to look at the other. We are making an assumption that either way they would look, they would reach the same outcome 
but the question is which one did they look at in order to reach well, well, which, and, and actually i think it's which one do they discuss you don't know what they looked at you look you just know what's in the opinion you know you know so, what they cite absolutely could, could so, i say something uh, as a co-author so i think there's there's a con, there's conflation here right so first of all um there's the fact that everyone wants to make a causal claim. We would like to make a causal claim as we would in almost all of our studies. It's just mathematically difficult to the point that we hedge to the point of only discussing correlations because that's just what we can do with observed data. Making a causal claim based on observational data is notoriously difficult, right? Um, so the only way to do, the simplest way to do a true causal claim would be like do a random intervention in terms of judges' opinions, which, which cannot be done. So in a sense, what we've provided, um, although the paper is pitched, it's not pitched this way, we don't write it this way, because you know there's a history of uh, trying to make causal claims based on correlational data in science, which is not great, which you could say our evidence is consistent with various causal readings, right? Because causation uh, implies correlation in a sense. Uh, it's not completely true, but... but um, in this sense, it's it's true. Um, in this paper, it is. So I think I think there there's the Jewish prudence question, which is like, what are you actually trying to measure? And then there's the question of what could you possibly extract from a set of case histories that would what could you extract that would have um, some relevance for Jewish prudence, right? Like, and that's that's sort of the. I, I thing. think that's a totally, I think that's a totally fair way of setting it up. And it's much, but it's but it's on its face. It's just saying, look, there's this interesting causal questions. We don't have experimental design here to get at causality. You know, you could imagine an experimental setup, but we don't have it. So we're going to do some other stuff. And we think it sheds light, light on, the, on the interesting questions here. And here's why. And here are the limitations. And that's just like that I, I could kind of read more. I still think it's not actually about precedent in this. It's about precedent in some very general sense, but it's not about the bindingness of precedence. It's about what judges discuss. And I, I, like I said, I do think there's something interesting here. It's just, um, I, I got crosswise on the intersection of the theory and what was being tested and how it was being tested and, and so on. No, I, I hear that. That's really interesting. So I'm not a, I'm not a, a legal expert or a lawyer, but I do, I'm a, I do do a lot of these sorts of information theoretic things in NLP and sort of, especially more for other aspects of science. So I think from our paper methodologically based was based on similar linguistic claims that we we made and, and we adapted it. But I think it's sort of very novel in the sense that, you know, this is a different set of evidence one could bring to bear on some of these questions. And I don't think an eight page paper is going to close the book on that. You know, it might raise more questions than it answers. And it might, so that sense, like, I, I think it's very much an open question, what sort of evidence one can extract from large legal corpora, et yeah. cetera, et cetera. And, and the extent that the, you know, the verbiage um, in any paper is, is never perfect, especially when you have these sort of, every scientist wants to ask a causal question and generally only has correlational data, right? That's a fact of being a scientist. And of course, the, the way to which that is yeah. possibly, I mean, uh, observational, I mean, some medical trials, of course, right. are interventions, but if you, uh, it's, it's a yeah. very hard thing to explain. Uh, yeah, no, I get it. I mean, I don't want to like harp on this and, you know, it, I, but I don't think it's enough to just wave the hand in direction and say, look, I, we have observational data and no one can ever make causal claims based on anything. You know, it's like, look, you set it up as this like test between two theories of, you know, precedent and how it operates. And, you know, that's just the setup of the paper, right? And if you have some uh, theory and linguistics or something like that, that allows us to get traction on, on these questions. That's cool. I mean, I would be open to that, but it's, so anyway, I, I, I take it for what it's worth as a reader response. I got very crosswise on what looked to be an, like a, like a test uh, of the, the hypotheses about how precedent operated that was being tested in the paper. And um, it didn't seem like that was being pulled off. I think the more nuanced way that you just kind of framed it um, is good. And I'm not even sure that you need to have all this wraparound about these two different theories of precedent and everything else. Um, although, or, or at a much higher level of abstraction where you're not testing between them, but it's like a motivation for your interest in this fact versus argument distinction and the relationship of these things in prior papers and so on. Um, again, take it, for, take, it for, take it for what it's worth. All right. Yeah, thanks, thanks. thanks, that's very helpful. We mostly get NLP feedback on our paper, which is a, a very different perspective. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Michael. Uh, all right, so we have a couple of minutes for questions from the audience. Uh, if you have any questions, just drop them in the chat or just uh, 
uh, use your mic. I'm just looking around. So thank you so very much for this super interesting conversation. I'm looking around the room and I see, so, so Vaclav has problems with his mic, which makes me the only kind of legal scholar outside of the speakers who has a mic. So I'm just going to try to use that as well. And uh, so I, I really see a lot of really interesting points in everything that has been mentioned, uh, because I think on the one hand, um, I, I also felt a little bit uh, misled, you know, as a legal scholar thinking about common law and then kind of reading about ECTHR cases because then and at least in you know in more traditional comparative law and I'm going to say this as a continental scholar and not a common law person but uh, as a civil law scholar um, that you know comparative law has this kind of, kind of common law civil law um, dichotomy that that it holds it, it has a very specific role, I think, uh, especially in legal studies. So um, I was wondering, so apart from this, um, I also thought that the, the paper was making a very interesting contribution, just going beyond kind of fact or entity extraction from the perspective of facts. Um, but I have this question that perhaps, I don't know, maybe we can just uh, reflect upon generally if anybody else finds it interesting. Um, you know, what does it take to actually model a legal argument? And then what are the differences between different jurisdictions, because I think that modeling a legal argument, you know, and the way in which kind of Judge Posner writes legal arguments is one thing. And then if you go to France and you're going to see how a French judge is going to write legal arguments, that's going to be a completely different ballgame. And that's, I'm even speaking about decisions that have arguments, because there are also a lot of jurisdictions where, where you know, uh, courts are very much a, uh, a process. They're, they're, it's like, it's procedure. They're very much based on procedure and, and processes and then that's also going to entail you know you don't have the the, the necessary the, like the ideal the optimal time of formulating a legal argument but you need to get cases out of the courtroom um, and then for for that matter for instance you can look at the the absolutely abysmal numbers of uh, you know the 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 lags that exist in the Italian um, the court system I see uh, Giovanni oh no Giovanni is also here he's also a legal scholar so I don't know if he has anything to say about that sorry for throwing Italy under the bus Giovanni sorry for that um, but so what I'm trying to say is that you know if you look at actual decisions you know ideally you could have these really beautiful formulations of okay this is the reason why we have uh, decided this but in in practicality you can't really draw that so I'm just wondering you know what does it take or what do you need from a legal argument to be able to model it and um uh, you know, what, what kind of threshold uh, could we think about computationally? Uh, because then that means that under this threshold, we simply need to discard all of these jurisdictions that simply are never going to be able to, to represent the, the uh, application of the law in the decisions uh, in, in case law, regardless of whether maybe they're common law or civil law. So once more, thank you for this amazing discussion. I can start. Um, it's, just, it's a large question. Uh, I, I, I'll try by twisting it slightly and, and ask it in terms of the what would be the burden to, to, to use any of this technology um, in a court? What would we need to be able to do? Um, and I think that um, depending on which act you choose, um, the burden will be different. Um, um, if you set the burden at the level of judge, if, you, if this would be a model that is actually judging someone, God forbid, of course, at this point, anything that exists. But um, but if, if it, imagining that, that machine, it, it needs to basically be human. It needs to be an actor in society. It needs to understand the swings of uh, of the society, the changes. It needs to be an act. It, it will play an active role in developing it. It's an incredibly high uh, uh, burden to place. Um, that I, I don't think that any any machine that uh, that is uh, you know just a black box uh, telling spitting out an answer can 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 deliver even if there's justification. I think that machine needs to basically be in some sort of science fiction interaction with humans and embody it and, and live and understand and empathize. Otherwise, uh, it, it becomes very Orwellian very quickly. Um, but taking that thought experiment and turning it to the lawyer, then perhaps the, the, the lawyer, if there is a human judge, doesn't require that, that high of a burden because the function of the lawyer is to persuade the judge. So I don't find that that dystopic, that a machine produces a brilliant uh, argumentation that persuades a human judge, um, as long as there is a human judge to look over it 
and, and, and sort of adjudicate over it. So if that machine is capable of that, I don't think it needs to necessarily be some sort of embedded uh, AI within society that, that completely emphasizes, etc. It can be just a box that spits out text, um, whether that's possible, whether a box that spits out text can understand human nature to that point to be as persuasive as a, as a, as a human, um, to a human. Well, I guess Turing has been asking that question all along, but I, I, uh, I, I will not be able to answer that. But I would say that those are the two, two, two burdens um, that, that we are facing. Okay, so we have one more question from Leslie. Uh, is in the chat. How hard is to identify factual versus legal discussion language in these documents? That's an easy one to answer. It's very easy because they are separated by... Um, heading so you look up a heading and under that heading you have the factual what we call factual uh, and under heading the law you have the argumentative of course there's an overlap so um there's an this, in this HR, actually it is easy right but i i forgot to mention that there is a another part of Leslie's question which is a little further up in the or anything else in the chat because in the u.s court actually the the, the problem is a bit more complex because uh, opinions and facts uh, and arguments are mixed in the in the final report uh, produced by the court yeah i think someone uh, mentions it there that it's it, it's incredibly hard that someone needs to do, uh, manually annotate it and then there's a lot of doubt about it here we are referring to what the judges themselves have decided is factual description and what they themselves have decided is the legal. So it, it, we, we circumvent the difficulty of the annotation, which is a pitfall. But of course, circumventing it doesn't get rid of the obvious criticism there, which is, well, surely the argumentative part contains factual description as well, which, but that's, I guess, part of our question there as well. You know, it's uh, just where can you extract the information easier or where is more correlations uh, yeah. language. perfect okay cool thanks very much uh, yeah. are there any other questions Good i mean we have three, three minutes over but uh, if there is a final question just drop it now no okay otherwise i could uh, I, I would like to thanks uh, thank again uh, joseph and michael for this uh, very interesting uh, discussion and the presentation of the paper uh, before we go just a reminder that uh, the first call of papers for uh, the Natural Legal Language Processing Workshop is out. I don't have presentation rights uh, here to show you the, the call for papers, but you can find the link uh, here. So deadline is uh, somewhere, uh, okay, it's on uh, the 20th of August, so please, uh, submit your papers, natural language processing or opinion papers, or uh, let's say more theoretical um, uh, papers from the legal perspective are all welcome. Uh, and uh, well, thanks a lot again and uh, see you soon. I don't know if we, do we have a quick question. Do we have another seminar series before the, the next semester or is that the final one before we go on holidays? This is the final one before we go on holidays. So thank you very much. And uh, I also need to mention that Michael and Joseph, you're going to get a complimentary mug, an NLP mug. So I'm going to be in contact with you via email for your addresses, if that's okay. And Ryan, thank you for joining. So uh, we're going to send one to you as well. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a great summer and thank you. Thank you, Max. Thanks. And Nikos for organizing Catalina. Thank you all very much for having me. And of course, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the mark. Um, so <laughs> carry on a cake. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great, Have a great day. weekend, guys. See you. Bye. 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 -bye.